All right, folks, we are back. Hey, I have to, I know I sound probably okay, but I am a little bit under the weather tonight. So excuse that. But I can tell you, we've got an exciting guest tonight. It is Matthew Rogers, the Matthew Rogers, the young 22-year-old live scope shooting mother. I mean, the guy is on fire fire already this year he won at darbone at crappie masters so we get him tonight we get to talk to him we're going to ask him all these questions about live scope so if you have an interest in how to find these big fish that's the important thing the big fish we want the tournament size fish this guy has the secrets we're going to talk about baits lines fishing poles what's his tactic how is he's finding these big fish during these tournaments and uh Three pound fish and has them. So Matthew Rogers, I just literally got off the phone with him, learned so much about the young guy. Um, we actually talked for, I'm guessing for 45 <laughs> minutes before this, um, just learning about each other and learning about, about the industry. And the guy is so, uh, for 22 years old is extremely insightful. Um, so I value his opinion hugely. And obviously his track record is uh, full of victories. This guy, knows what's going on um, in the industry and um, in particular with live scope. So let's just point that out because the guy has, he's the one guy can be on the, on that front of that boat, picking out those big fish. And so I'm excited about what that tactic, his thought process. And uh, we're going to be talking about that today. So uh, we are about to, this is going to air Thursday night. So welcome to Thursday night, right? So, uh, we are going to be heading to, uh, we have a local event this weekend, Three Pound Fishing does, and then we are going to be headed to Grenada. We are going to be um, doing a, doing our pre-fishing, the tournaments the following weekend, that type of thing. So the tournament schedule, tournament season for Three Pound Fishing has definitely started off. March is a huge busy month for us. We appreciate you guys following us. We will take you along for the ride, um, pre-fishing. Um, you name it, you're going to be in the boat every day. It'll be a, probably a different episode. Maybe it'll be pre-fish on one episode and then the tournament on another. But we love doing that, me and Wade. So we are actually practicing today and uh, for the event this weekend here locally. And uh, we had some success. We found some uh, good fish. Let me show you what we were fishing with. Happen to have a package right here. Boom. So fire and ice. I'm going to bring it up again. Check them out at jinkofishing.com. Fire and ice. That's been the, the secret right now. So what else do we have to talk about? Uh, guide trips. One last thing. Guide trips. Check it out. If you want Southern Illinois, Lake of Egypt, Kincaid Lake, Rin Lake, three pound fishing, uh, you can email me at three pound fishing at gmail.com. So we're going to wait for Matthew Rogers to show up. I sent him the link. He should be here any, any moment. And uh, so... I'm excited to have you, Matt. I really do appreciate you taking the time and sharing with the three pound audience yeah. um, about what you're doing. And um, live scope, you know, is a big part of what we try to share. And so to get your insights today and how you're catching these big fish, man, we really do appreciate it. Yeah, I, I enjoy talking about it. I really do. Uh, you know, it's a really neat tool. Um, it's it's kind of taken over. Everybody's got it. I was I, whenever I pulled into Truman uh, Creek, that's kind of a. Uh, creek that holds big fish and not a lot of people per se that are just out there catching fish for meat um you fish it a lot and they're starting to be more and more because people are seeing you're able to see the fish and have confidence to go catch them now as to where shoot before it, that's so different the tournament waters are so different than you know numbers of waters more and more people that uh, don't tournament fish are showing up in that stuff because they're they're noticing you know it's a little easier to catch them with the live scope but there's a lot of things that are going to have to be impl imp implemented on conservation laws and stuff eventually and i'm really afraid of truman because not only are the fish super vulnerable right now feeding up for the spawn you know you're able to catch big fish i mean right. there's, and there's we had a flood year last year so it saved a lot of fish and there's just a ton of big fish in the lake right now right so 
I appreciate that because I, I totally believe in conservation. And, and actually, we talk, we throw back all of our fish. We, we do everything we possibly can to help the cause. Let me let me ask, go back to the Lake Darbone win from last year. Let's start there because then we're going to get in a live scope and the hair jigs. Oh, yeah. hear all that stuff. But tell us, give me the give me the story of the tournament and uh, how you came up on top. Uh, there was a lot of highs and lows. Pre-fishing, uh, as soon as we got down there, the first spot, I looked at a map and wanted to stop and fish. We went to, and um, 10 feet down after I put the troll motor in, we caught a 220, 229. So instantly I start analyzing what's going on there, and uh, I noticed that there wasn't any more two-plus pounders in this this hole. And it's just big flats out there on that lake, and there's a river channel. The boat lanes actually don't necessarily run through the river channel, they had been cut and then they put poles up and you run those lanes while the channel swings out. So there was a lot of things going on where the channel swings out and there's not boat pressure. There's fish in the river channel there, but where the boats go over the river channel, a lot of fish weren't there. So some of those places where it ran through the river channel, it was pushing right. those fish up and into the bowls, fish that weren't supposed to be there yet. So like that 229, there was a lot of pound and a half fish in there, but those giant, a lot of those were males those big females were set up in the where they really want to be was the river. And that was in the upper end. But part of the problem was there wasn't enough of the river channel that the boat lane went over. So I don't think those fish were pressured and getting pushed up there. I think they were deep into the shad, a lot of them, but that little specific area worked and uh, it was going to be out of the wind for the first day. So we kind of grinded out that first day there, but I really knew the, more consistent big fish were down in the main part of the lake. Gotcha. How deep were you fishing? Uh, how, how deep were the fish? How deep were the, was the water column? What were you, how were you catching the fish the first day? You know, the first day we went down and we were, we were dipping with uh, 13 foot poles. Um, and then, I mean, immediately I started noticing if the dandruff fell out of your head onto the deck of the boat, the fish were spooking. I mean, it was they were super, super spooky. And there was things causing them to be spooky. Of course, spring, the moon phase, and the fish aren't thinking about eating. They were thinking about moving up. The days are getting longer, so that, that causes a natural reaction in the fish to start moving shallow. Um, and... We were in, you know, I figured out real fast the deeper holes were where the fish were holding. Um, and that would be 14 to 18 foot of water. Wow. I never found any fish in any of the shallower depressions. So there was there was a lot of things going on, especially up in that upper end. I had a buddy that fished the upper end the first day of the tournament, and he seen thousands of fish, he said, just of all species. Um, and the the where the rivers, the headwaters in a lake and the shallow water will warm up faster. And within the second day, after I talked to them the second day, they didn't see hardly any fish up there on that second day. So there was, there was a lot of things happening. You know, the lower into the lakes, a bigger area, deeper water, it takes a little bit longer to warm up. So those fish gotcha. still a true pre-spawn pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, take your time. Yeah, don't matter, brother. There, the the uh, fish down there though were getting extremely pressured in the holes, and um, those were deep enough holes. There was more deep flats down there than there was up above. You know, it was ten foot flats in the uh, above a certain bridge. It was called the thirty three bridge. Above it, there was ten foot flats, and eh, twelve, thirteen, fourteen foot holes. Some of them were eighteen. Of course, the eighteen foot holes were the were patternable there was multiple fish in them um but there just wasn't enough of them so you know instantly i noticed that i'm gonna have to be down in that lower end but it was gonna be windy that first day and dang near impossible right and i think a lot of guys just thought they could tough it out and that that noise coming off the bottom of the boat with any of the popping from the waves or boats running by it, it, i really think that really affected them the first day and just killed the bite down there um but the main thing that helped me was i figured out when they were in those bowls there's also kind of ditches that run out uh, slow depressions that come out of them and when those boats would get inside of those depressions 
and they were already spooky. Well, those fish were leaving through those other little ditches and stuff. And so I'd set myself up kind of on the outside edge of where the people were fishing. And uh, basically they just pushed the fish to me, you know. Gotcha. Uh, of course, they were already spooky. So some fish I'd have to chase in open water for 50, 60 yards. Um, but these and, fish were deep. These fish were deep. Yeah, they were 12, 13, 14 foot down, some of them. And every once in a while, you'd get to come across one that was six foot down. And you'd have an opposite, of, I mean, just a polar opposite effect with a fish six foot down and one 14 foot down. The one 14 foot down might eat. And then the next one that you come across that was six foot down might do the same thing. The one that you just come across. Right. Um, and 14 foot of water did and, and just dart out and, and crush it. And then some of them would be 14 foot down. And I was casting and I, I'm actually going to show you the rig I was kind of using when I was casting. I'd cast out to them. And when that jig would hit the water 40 feet away from my boat, that fish 14 foot down would take off. Um, really? Oh, yeah. They're extremely spooky. And I think a lot of that had to do with so many boats being over the top of them. Right. This live scope, I think, has a little bit to do with that. People are targeting these fish and putting pressure on more, you know, than what they would normally if they just spider rigged through and caught two or three and spider rigged back and maybe caught two or three. There's 40 over three. <laughs> now we're able to see those other 40 and target them. So those fish are, are definitely a little more spooky. You know, you had... 80 boats pre-fishing down 87 boats pre-fishing down there putting pressure on them so uh there was you know it'd be totally different in a probably 20 boat tournament and they were running pulling water and that lake normally doesn't have any current in it so that was really setting different fish up differently you know that's one thing about any lake is i'm sure you see it on egypt there's fish on one side of the lake that might be six foot down and there might be fish 15 foot down on the other side of the lake. There's right. always lots of different things going on, even in the same water temperature. They're kind of a, they kind of have a brain of their own, all of them. Um, it just depends on the clarity of the lake, uh, what part of the country it's in, what kind of <laughs> uh, soils it has around it and different bottom contents. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it all. And, uh, of course, the easiest thing and why crappie fishing is so popular is because in the spring, you can go to just about any lake in the country and the fish are active yeah. and sp spawning and they react to a bait so easy. You know, kids can throw a cork to them. You know, it's bass fishing is a totally different animal. <laughs> All right, so so after day one, you're in. I believe it was sixth place, if I remember yep. correctly. So yep. the next day, you you fish the other side of the lake, and you go and you what do you change up? What changes? Well, um, I got to fish in the deeper water where there's more big fish, and uh, I, I kind of went at it a different way than those guys were. You know, like I said, I was setting myself up on those outside edges of them, and they're just kind of pushing the fish to me. Um, I confirmed that was happening though. That was just a theory. And then I confirmed it on the second day, first morning, whenever I put my trolling motor down before start time out on the outside edge in the ditch that I wanted to fish. And I was just checking it. And I noticed all these just, that, I took a video of it. There was tons and tons of fish coming out of there. And the closer I got to where there was four boats in this deep pole, uh, I've seen one here one there and right. now if i would have instantly recognized that and went out and started back out where i seen all those fish instead of drifting in and waiting till seven o'clock start time and starting there i, I could have maybe upgraded a couple more fish um and i believe that and i think that's what helps me is i believe uh, if i if it's something that i think is true and i believe it i it almost like it's you can try to make it happen you know right um and I was actually casting to these fish, and uh, I have I have I had different split shots that I use, and different different just different setups. But this is my favorite. I've got a sixteenth back here, and I was using a sixteenth with a um, 
Bobby Garland, Baby Shad, and I don't have the Baby Shad here with me. So no paddle tail, no no action on the tail at all? Uh, no, and I have. And you're casting it? Yep. I had done, uh, I casted a hair jig and caught fish on day two. I'd casted a, um, bob, uh, a bait like what I make right here. You know, and of course, whenever I was reeling it back to me, I just, I was shaking my rod just a little bit. Whenever I, if I'd get over the top of them and above them, I would shake it. If I got too close to them, they're so spooky, I didn't want to cause any more vibration. Right. But then I, I went to a complete reaction from those fish. I started throwing stuff with spinners on them to make those fish react out of aggression. Um, and I started catching a lot more of them. It would go by them, and I'd burn it kind of by them. I wasn't, I wasn't going nice and easy with them. I would take it and burn it right by them. And those fish were facing away from me. And whenever I'd burn it by them, they didn't act like they seen it. They'd get four or five feet behind them, and they'd turn, and they would dart right out to it and, really? and nail it. And those were the ones that I could get a reaction out of. Those ones right. that were like lethargic, just in a weird, uh, a dormant state. I could go up and take a jig and run it in a 360 degree circle around that fish and never get it to react to it. Oh, and then wow. take the bait and shake it and bounce it on them and touch them. And they would just drift off. You know, there, there's so much stuff. I think this is the time of the year that starts happening though, because you got all the way in through until May, you know, you can catch fish that are on the bank fish that are pre-spawn still and fish that are post-spawn. So I just think there's lots of, you know, there's thousands of crappie in a lake. You're going to go, you're going to see a few hundred that are in each state of mine, you know? Right. But So when you're casting out to these fish, are you casting 20, 30, 40 feet out? How far? And are you following it on live scope? As it's coming back. Yeah. Oh yeah. I follow, but that's where, you know, being good with it. And just knowing where you're at in coordination where you you can see it get close to them. And if you need to compensate and pull up and through the wind again because you're drifting back, you can keep it and re remember where you're at, you know, and keep it. Just keep it at a steady pace coming to you. That way you stay pretty close to them. That's the biggest thing is boat control with live scope. Um, you know, and I look at live scope as a tool. I've never looked at it like it's something that I'm. I'm great at. I look at it as a tool and you got to get good with it. You know, um, anybody can buy a nail gun and try to build a house, but some people <laughs> are going to build a house better. Um, I, I plugged one in in December of not this year, but the year before and took it out and it just kind of come natural to me. And I, I'd used pan optics before that prior hand, but, um, chasing the fish, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a lot of coordination. And I guess I, I've done a lot. I, I golfed and did a lot of different sports growing up. So my hand and eye coordination and my feet coordination, I guess, is kind of in sync and I guess fine. I mean, I, you know, I've never looked at it from a, out of, out of my person perspective, from a, you know, another person's perspective. I just kind of do what I do and fish. So, right. I, I've never been able to explain to somebody how to get good with it, you know, because what you see is what you get with it. You know, there's a few settings and stuff that you can change. Um, I actually, when I give seminars, I get into real, uh, really deep detail about what TVG stands for. And uh, it's time varied gain. It's a signal compensation. It's, it's getting sent out and returned. And it's, it's what they've used on, military equipment for years to be able to tell there's a giant rock they're getting ready to hit in a submarine or a, a, a torpedo coming at them you know it, it shows right. the different sizes so when your tvg is off everything looks bigger your bait looks bigger um, when you start to turn it on medium and then high it interprets it different you know a pound fish is is going to kind of look a little more like a pound fish a pound and a half two pound fish will look bigger it changes they're not as bright and stuff but their outline is bigger um so is your tvg on or off i, I run it off um I run I, off too. now whenever i go to grenada mississippi where i'm just looking for two two plus pound crappie 
I might run it on low, you know, um, but you lose, you lose your jig really easily, you know, and, and right. it doesn't really bother me because I, I know where I'm at anyway, unless something gets knocked off. But right. uh, I'd say the easiest way to run is definitely with it off. And uh, a lot of people ask about gain and gain and color gain are two different things. Gain is actually uh, sensitivity. Color gain is contrast. So no matter what fish finder you've ever had, there's usually sensitivity and contrast on them. And Garmin right. has a different format for uh, sensitivity and contrast on other units as well. But with the live scope, your sensitivity being gain, you know, you can turn it down and bump your contrast up for different things. When fish start getting into structure deep, you know, I back my sensitivity or my contrast down and turn up my sensitivity a little bit. And I can see those fish a lot better. You know, Truman Lake was. I believe it got 39, 39 feet high last year. And those fish were in bushes and stuff. And when you had your sensitivity high, it just looked like a big blob on there. Right. You know, I'd back my sensitivity down to just about well, my uh, gain back down to like 45, 50. And What's I your can, nose reject on then? Do what? What's your no, noise reject on? Right I run now? it on medium. A medium. So is your gain roughly around what? 65 ish. Yeah. 55 to 65. Yeah. I'd say 50 to 65 is probably the range I run the most. I don't ever get into 70 and 80 because I think when there's a fish tight to a tree and a lot of times a fish will get on a, um, sorry, my, my coordination is off it's with backwards, this. right? My it's left backwards. is right. My right is left, Yeah. but they get on a tree and they might, a lot of crappie will sit um, vertical with a, a tree that's vertical, you know. Right. Or if they get on a horizontal limb and they get up under it, they can get, instead of sitting under it like that, they can get up next to it. And you might just see the bottom outline of them. So I like to back that sensitivity down and my contrast. That way I can see the separation in the two. You know, if you got it turned up, everything's real bright and kind of has a fuzz around it. And uh, I think. You know, I can go behind somebody that's using it and has all that turned way up and I can pick apart a tree or a laid down tree or a brush pile or steak bed a little bit better than they can. You know, especially a steak bed. Those fish can get down on the bottom of a steak bed and you can't even see them. You know, I mean, just they're still able to hide a little bit for sure. You know, rock. There's a, I know Egypt, they get on a lot of rock there, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. They get on grass ledges, they get on ledges, they get on. Absolutely. Yeah. Can it, I, I, I want to go back to your leg, Darbone Dar Dar win, and then I'm going to go. I want to talk nothing but about live scope. But uh, oh, so yeah. did, after day one, did you feel like you were in position? After day two, did you feel like you, you had done the best? You felt like you were in a good position? Because you did come from behind, even it, being in position, I mean, sixth place. So did you think you had done? How did you feel going into that way in being that I, it, it got windy a lot during pre-fishing. So I got to see a lot of how those fish were acting and I didn't necessarily get to go put my live scope down and catch some of these fish that were in these places I was going to fish, you know, but I just knew that there was big fish there. I mean, we're on Darbone Lake, you know, and it's known for two pound crappie. So I knew there was two pound crappie from the dam to the end of the river. So I just kind of, man, I really grinded out the first day. I did what I could. I mean, we fished so hard and, uh, we had, we had 14 pounds on our scale and the scales on their scales were weighing light that day. So we had 1389 and ended up sixth. So I, I knew what I, I knew what I did with, uh, us places that I didn't necessarily want to fish. So, I just had the confidence that when I get to fish tomorrow or the next day and fish the places that I know the big ones are in, you know, we're going to have a good bag of fish. And uh, if, if I get lucky enough that I can catch three kickers, that's why I told myself, I said, we need three kickers with the rest being two pounders. And a kicker to me is over two and a quarter in a tournament like that. And we had a 233, a 240 and a 250 for our, our three biggest fish. And, uh, 
but I knew we set. I know. I knew we set ourselves up. We did the everything we could to catch what we could uh, for our biggest seven fish that day. And you know, if somebody else had a big bag and they were already set up and second place it was going to be really really hard to to get them and uh terry stewart um was probably the one that i was worried about the most because he's extremely extremely consistent and he was in third i like to be in third or fourth you know i was i think a pound and a quarter out roughly right and, uh, it doesn't seem like a lot but it it, it, it really is in crappie fishing because you can lose by uh, hundreds. I've lost by hundreds. I lost a classic last year grenade, uh, on Grenada to Robert Carlisle by thir 13 hundreds would have tied us, 14 hundreds would have um, won, and that's of an ounce. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a few drops of water in there, you know. <laughs> no doubt. So, um, when we put our bag up and it ended up when we had 1589 on our scale and you know, with the water, with water and everything else that's added into that, their scale, you know, they have a really good weighing system with using a bag and it's as fair level playing field as you can get. So you, you do get a little bit of gain each day and sometimes, you know, Sometimes it's a little more, a little less. The scale, you know, they zero them out. And uh, I think barometric pressure in the air and everything has a little bit to do with how that scale sure. locks yeah. in. But um, we had 1647, and I uh, I thought, man, you know, that's a good bag. We did everything we could do. I just was waiting for Terry Stewart. I knew the Williamses told me they just, they just didn't have a good day like they had the first day, and they let it, so – I knew if the leaders stumbled, you know, and I, I didn't stumble on the second day. I knew we had them. And after after Terry Stewart weighed in and he had a little shy of what he needed, I think he needed, I want to say, 15, 15.04 pounds, and he had 14, I think, 37 or 27. I, I, I'd have to look again. But um, I knew we had it. Um, yeah, that's, it's it's an awesome, awesome feeling. I can't but imagine. To be real honest, with how my brain works, <laughs> I already was thinking about, well, you know, man, I'd like to be able to go back out and go check two more other spots that we could, or two more trees <laughs> to catch another big one. You know, that's what I think. <laughs> and uh, getting to share that moment with my my dad is it's probably the coolest for sure. You know, that's we awesome. uh, we I, he's been my best friend since day one you know and uh he uh we butt heads a little bit in the boat of course father and son. who but, wins who wins the argument <laughs> uh i'd say dad every time for sure um you know we were actually the last spot that we were in we were debating on going and fishing some other stuff and uh i just caught a 240 there a 207 and then i was like let's go we strapped everything down and I told him he was trying to get me to stay. And I was like, there ain't no more big fish here. And he said, well, how do you know? And I said, I just know. <laughs> and uh, he said, just, okay. And he strapped the, rod, the rods down. And I ended up grabbing one more for, I had my one in my hand. And he had strapped the net down. And I seen a giant. And uh, I pitched out to him and caught it and got caught the thing and he, i said get the net and he goes well we don't need a net there's no more big fish here <laughs> <laughs> and uh he got it unstrapped and I, I got it up to the top and he netted it and it was a, that 250 and i think when i caught that i knew somebody's gonna really have to have a good bag to to get us and uh and it ended up working out you know and and uh you know we're already I'm already ready to prep and get back into my map reading for Grenada. Um, and that's going to be, that's going to be a wild animal. I didn't get to fish it last year. Um, and it was, I think it's right around the same water level. I think you fished it last year, didn't you? I did. Yeah, we, we enjoyed it. That was a great time for us. We actually got big fish, Matt. So yeah, we were like, it was our claim to fame last year. We, we were in ninth 
ninth or tenth place after the of, after the first uh, day, and then we stumbled, but we held on to big fish, which we were. That was that's what we have to hang our hat on. <laughs> hey, so it's you got to have something, you know. That's something to build on. Uh, I build on stuff every week. I, I I put confidence into just everything I can, whether it's when I go pour baits and I pour a new color. I yeah. put a little confidence into that and I just believe that it'll work. You know, I might, I, I really had a lucky pair of jeans last year. <laughs> and they, they are so wore out that, you know, I can't even put them on anymore. All right. So, Hey, I, I want to talk about live scope, um, mm -hmm. but congratulations on that win. That was mm -hmm. awesome. Um, yeah. I, just watching the way in, I was rooting for you from the minute that I knew you were coming up in sixth place. And I was just, I can't wait to see what this guy brings to the table. And it was just, I mean, it was awesome, dude. So I, I congratulate you. I mean that from the deepest of my heart, I was like, and I'm sure everybody else was out there saying the same thing. And it meant a lot for guys that are trying to learn live scope and to see what you can do. And what you did last year in Grenada as I think it was the second day you fished by yourself. Was it? I was fished both, both days. That was, that that was on AC, yeah, ACT, yeah. right? Yep, the American Crop Trail. Um, yeah, the first day uh, I had a, I knew, I didn't even pre-fish a lot of stuff because I'd been there for the Crappie Masters. Um, man, that was kind of a simple pattern that I put together. There was 10 more foot of water on it whenever we were there, or whenever we were there for the Classic, and the fish were scattered, and then the water dropped like, I want to say eight feet roughly. So you got two foot of water on all that. You got to either, they could either be in a creek channel or they could be in the deepest bowl that's possibly around there. Right. And, um, they were in the deepest bowl that was around there. Um, and they had nowhere else to go, but that bowl, they did not want to be shallow. So even the boat pressure that was on top of all those fish, those, Fish were not leaving this one little area, and there was, there was like 30 boats there. So the first day I stayed out of their way, I was like, maybe they'll push some fish to me. I, I kind of believe that theory that people will spook fish to you, and I and I, I kind of struggled a little bit. Um, I think I had 13, I think I only had 13.54 or 59. I mean, I didn't have a very big bag of fish, and uh, I think 15... 15 something pounds was leading it. And then the second day, um, a couple of the buddies that I really stand out of their way, they said, you know, that they, they told me that night prior, they were like, you're, you're not going to bother us. You know, we're all probably going to end up pushing fish around to each other. And so I moved in into the deeper bowl and, uh, or I wanted to fish the first day really bad. And, uh, it was, man, it was lights out. And then, the wind I, I talked to matt morgan he filmed me and i said well I, they were wrong about the wind the weatherman's wrong today he said don't say that and i i'm not kidding five minutes after he left the wind blew 40 mile an hour and it rained i mean you could not see 15 feet in front of you that was the scariest part of me I, me ever being on the lake that was the scariest the scariest i've ever been i was it was unbelievable. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't. My troll motor wasn't powerful enough to turn and stay into it, so I had to blow with the wind. I ended up putting my power poles down just so I could get stuff situated because the minnow bucket blew over, all kinds of stuff was going on. So then the back of the boat started swamping because the waves coming over, and I fired up my big motor and idled up by a tree and tied off to it, put my troll motor down, and stayed there for about mm, – waves coming over the front of the boat i stayed there for four or five minutes trying to see if a fish would happen to come by and uh i finally fired up and got a, up to close to the graceport ridge where a little bit of a wind break was and uh i still had those 30 mile an hour wind gusts and i was having to put two hands on my pole to get it out but i i seen this fish and i just kept on going after him and actually terry and cole stewart got to kind of witness this i you know they were loading up and getting out and uh, going to go get against the bridge so they could get away from the wind. And they actually idled right by me when I finally got on this fish. And it was everything I could do with my troll motor and the rod. And I caught it, and it was a 240. And then I think I called like a, a 165 to a 240. And that wow. 
that's like a huge, huge jump. And then I caught another like 229 and a, um, I want to say I caught like a 236. And those were a 229 and a 236 were my smallest fish, you know. So I, I, I knew I had, I think I had 1680 on my scale or something like that. And I had yeah. 17, or I might have had right at 1690 something. And I had 1766 on their scale. So, wow. <laughs> you know, I think from ninth, ninth to win that one. I think that's, that's more prestigious to me to, to, you know, be completely under everybody's radar and then come in and, and bring in a giant bag, you know, have built from the first day. I, that's why I'm really excited for the uh, three day. I, I fished one three day tournament and that was Wally Marshall's crappie tournament on Ham his invitational last year on Lake Hamilton. And I really should have that lake fit a lot of my, my home lake of Stockton, um, clear water, brush piles. I should have fished better. Um, it's like Kevin Van Dam says, it's all about attitude. I had a bad attitude and uh, I didn't pre-fish the right way. And so the, the outcome wasn't the the right outcome I wanted. Um, this year, he just announced actually that it's going to be on Table Rock Lake, which is two and a half hours south of me. I, I've been on it when I was a young kid, right. um, but it's a really clear water lake. And uh, not a lot of people have experience on it, you know, that tournament crappie fish. So that's going to be a real interesting tournament for sure. And it's going to be exciting. I mean, that's yeah. going to be uh, – it, it, obviously, the what happened at Hamilton was kind of different. Uh, it was some of the hardest fishing that people had ever experienced. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, it would it, – actually, from – it's interesting. Just seeing great crappie fishermen struggle is kind of it's, – it's not a bad thing. Uh, it's, I love it's, it. It, 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 it made, you know, every day that you had to go out and pre-fish, you know, it didn't matter that it sucked and you're like, I've got to go out here and do this no matter what. And if it, it challenges you, yeah, it challenges you. And, uh, I think that's, what's neat about a three day tournament. Like it, it really separates, um, people who can pattern fish or people who just spot fish, you know, their spot wears out and then they don't got anything else. Uh, Tony Shepard and Mike Shepard are extremely good fishermen. I talked to him at Darbone about how those fish were turning around and shooting to the bait four feet away. And we were talking about doing the same thing about putting a niblet on it. That way when they turn around, they could trail it easier to find that. <laughs> those are things that just constantly come into a, my head, you know, um, and, and, and people like that, that just are thinking about the science behind the catching the fish all the time. And so are you learning the pattern because of what you're seeing on live scope? That's what you're, that's what you're, that's how you're educating yourself. Yeah. You're seeing, yeah. There's a lot of things. These days of process, you're seeing these fish move. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now there's things that, you couldn't necessarily prove before, but that's, that's the great part about fishing. And I think the, how you can become a great fisherman is developing theories, going out and trying to prove them wrong. That a way you can just redevelop them again and, and come up with something new and try to prove it wrong. Um, as long as you remember all the little details, um, it all builds, you know, and sometimes some of it will happen again. Not a lot of times, but you just, you, you build everything up to restart again. And I guess whenever that stops is whenever it, it becomes unenjoyable. You know, the right. fun part is thinking about tomorrow where I'm going to go fish and where they might be. Hopefully they're not there. So I have to go search and find them, you know, and then I remember that in five years that, in 2020 and March 4th, the uh, fish were in the back of Otter Creek on Truman Lake, you know, or the front of it, you know, and, and maybe applying that to the same water level in a few years. I think, I think that stuff replicates itself on, on lakes for sure. All right. I'm going to ask you some questions real quick that are, well, I think viewers are going to really want to know your thought process on the new view 
on perspective for Garmin. Mm -hmm. Start there. So, Are you going to use it? Your thought process? What do you? Yeah, I'm definitely going to use the new perspective from Garmin. Um, I actually, uh, of course, I, I'll have to wait until I, I can't remember when they're going to start shipping them out. Um, but I'm going to get one ordered and run. I'll probably run three units, honestly. Um, How? On, on the front of the boat, you mean? I'll, I'll run three units. I'll run one on my on my uh, troll motor, another one on a separate, uh, probably, I'll, I'll probably get one of the cornfield sweeper mounts. And then I'll also have, I'm going to have a fixed mount on the front of it, you know, something that's just fixed off, maybe off the, I might even run it off the top of the shaft. So there's going to be a lot of interference um, with that many different live scopes because they work off the same frequency there's going to be little flashes of interference on your screen but if you can kind of read through that and and, and deal with it you know it's it, it can make a i think a big difference because especially on a lake like truman lake or even grenada mississippi when you're going through that open water on perspective you might see something if you have your range set ran out to 100 feet you might see the scale is going to be small. You know, they're going to look small, but if you can see that fish out at a hundred feet, it's probably going to be a, a big, a big fish. Right. And when you're targeting big fish for tournaments, it, it makes a difference. But uh, even, even the perspective, whenever you're just going out and uh, trying to fill the freezer, <laughs> there's going to be a kid got some bowls. Um, you're going to see a tree that's loaded up with fish. Um, you know, there's the same thing with a live scope. There's, there's give and take when fish get into the rocks and stuff like that, or deep into the brush, it's kind of hard to see them. So it's, it's going to be, it's going to be an awesome, awesome tool. Um, I'm really excited to get it and use it. I know Josh Jones out of Oklahoma has, you know, he's, a, he does some beta testing. So he probably has had it for a little while and he's just been crushing giant largemouth bass. And uh, he posted a video the other day of it, of a, a big bass coming up into a bait school, you know, and it's just formatted totally different. You know, it's, it's as if you're standing on the front of your boat and you crystal it just made the water crystal, crystal clear and you could see what's going on, you know. So it's it's just it's, just, it's another tool. You're going to have to learn how to use it and maybe make out what certain things. So he, so uh, I saw Josh Jones is uh he has his perspective transducer and his normal live scope on this on the shaft of his troll motor together. And I thought that was interesting to see that. I was thinking about doing an independent pull like you're thinking. Yeah. Um, with having a combination of both that way, but I don't know what direction I will go. I would love to have, honestly, off of an old Trex 360 mount what they what they use the pre-tapped holes for for a 360 another foot control maybe cable where it's really fast so a part somebody that's in this that's using the other troll motor or not a troll motor but the other unit they're not going to have the reaction time i have with my my troll motor because i can go to something right with them being able to go fast and maybe they're going to have to use something really heavy. So they're probably going to have to go like, I've got a tungsten weight on this, you know, and it's got a bobber stop on the bottom of it. And I normally put one on the top too. I just grabbed one bobber stop. Um, they're going to have to run probably like a half ounce weight above so they can drop it down instantly when they see a fish, because I might be moving and pulling them away from them. Right. And there's, you know, there's going to be tournament teams that really figure that out and they work really good together. And, uh, they're going to be hard to really, they're really going to be really hard to beat because one of them might be sitting there pitching out to them at 30 feet and the other one's got it on 20 feet and he's, you know, dipping to them. Right. And, uh, they're covering a lot more water and fish than what I am if I'm by myself and I've only got one ran out on 20 feet. There's going to be lots of this wild stuff. You're going to see crazy stuff tournament fishing for the next probably year. You, you opened my eyes. When you won that at Grenada last year in the fall, I was like, oh, my gosh, is crappie fishing going to go to one guy boats? That's what went through my head. 
I mean, obviously the thought of getting rid of spider rigging went through my head too, uh, but I was starting to think, gosh, could this actually become a one person of, um, and I don't know if there, it will or not, but I just, yeah. it made me think that it could. There's a chance, you know, there's a, there's pro crappie trail does a one person tournament. And it's really enjoyable. I went and fished the one they had on Lake Fork and I got third in that. Um, a super, super fun tournament, but it's hard to take then, you know, I, I enjoy fishing with my dad no matter what, it, but it, it does suck for him if he's not fishing. You know, there's lakes that he can fish. So Truman Lake with hedge trees, I love having two jigs in there um, and a big wooly hedge tree or a brush pile or stake bed. You get out on Grenada Lake or even Darbone and it's just individual fish. You know, another person pitching to them, unless you guys are really, really coordinated, it, 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 two jigs falling is, it might spook them, you know. Right. It, it's, it's, it is kind of a one-person deal and on some lakes. There's some lakes that it's not, though, and uh, we had a tournament trail last year on Truman Lake that me and my dad fished a couple of them together that was uh, no lives, no no electronics on the front of the oh, right. <laughs> That's and, awesome. I had a lot of fun that way. I, I, I did t terrible in some of the tournaments because I didn't spend any of the spend any time. With, uh, <laughs> didn't spend any time on the water pre-fishing because I was I was gone or I was guiding on a different lake. Um, but I fished. The, I qualified for the classic of it, and uh, we fished it together. And you know, it went back to the roots. You know, we we're both fishing a tree just like we used to. You know, he had maybe fish an eighth straight down, and I would, or he would pitch a, you can't play with plugs, buddy. <laughs> that's not that's not safe for you. Um, but the, um, you know, he would look for a limb on the outside edge of a hedge tree. Maybe he might pitch an eighth. It just depends. But then once he finds a limb, I, I run down it slow and fish it, you know, and it's, it's, it's really truly fishing then. Um, and we ended up second in the classic of it, but that, that kind of went back to the core core of like us fishing together, you know, how, you know, I mean, it was really fishing. Now it, it's kind of, it's kind of a little more, you got to be a little more high strung with it. You know, I don't want to spook fish. So, the less the less stuff going on the better um shoot he spooked on grenada during the classic uh three or four of the fish that would have won it you know just by setting a meta cooler lid not you know because he didn't he wasn't seeing the fish you know he would dip trees as we went by him and i was out here fishing for those he might shut the meta bucket or take a step i mean these, these anything like that high pressure lakes are so spooky that you can you can just move your foot on the carpet and they feel that vibration you know it's all amplified underwater of course so you're saying me playing my radio on my boat's not a good idea <laughs> you know some there might be fish though that are curious to that on the striper guides in texas on texoma and places like that they take a in the especially in the winter they take a rod and hit their hit their boat and it causes the shad to, to come up and I'll watch. And then that causes a reaction out of the stripers, but I watch crappie in the middle of shad. just sit there, but it's like what they see in nature and their instincts are, you know, a shad slowly falling one that might be dying. They target that one, but there's, there's shad swimming all over around them, you know, and you can toss in a crappie jig and float it down by them slow and they'll shoot up and eat it. It's, it's crazy that how the fish really react to stuff. I mean, it just live scope obviously is the only way we truly knew what was going on, unless it was something that you thought you know you'd experienced a couple of times. Maybe a fish pulling um, your jig off of a limb, or you're hung up on a stump. There was the theory that I always figured: well, they probably have slowly came up stumps and had mayflies or bugs you know, on the edge of the stump right where it meets the water and they come, you know, because if a bug gets in the water and its wings get wet, like a mayfly, they can't fly anymore. They just kind of get up on something where they can grab a hold of it, you know, and I've always thought that the fish probably had come up and they'd see those 
just on the edge of the water and get them. So I always thought that's why they pull your jig off of a stump. Now that I got live scope, every time I get hung up or I'm, I got a fish coming up and I just keep raising my jig and I get hung up on the tree, then they look at it and they turn around and they take off. <laughs> so it, 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 it was the complete opposite of what I really thought. But there's some stuff that, you know, you can kind of see that's that's right. You know, and Ronnie Caps says it right. He says, if you catch one fish, mm, that, that can be a, a mistake. If you catch two, that's a pattern. So if you can figure out why you caught two, you can usually catch two more. And then that turns into six and then you got eight. And, and I think that's kind of, you know, where where people kind of go wrong with, with that is they – especially if they're spot fishing, you know, if you're spot fishing, you're not moving with the fish. You just go back to places that you'd caught them before. But generally, uh, I guess pan fishing is getting more and more popular with live scope and crappie fishing, especially. So there's more and more people getting out and seeing, seeing those things going on. But used to, you'd, if you weren't an avid fisherman, you'd see where people were at and where they had been fishing. And then you'd, you'd kind of move, it was kind of a normal thing for people, especially on Truman Lake, to move with the boats. Wherever the boats right. are, that's where everybody's fishing, and that's where everybody keeps going to, right. and it gets pretty crowded. Uh, so fishing's just evolving, and more and more people are getting into it. Like you were saying on the phone earlier, you know, crappie fishing's exploding. It's it's yeah. it's, it's 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 got a lot of growing to do though. Um, but there's more crappie. I think there's a lot more crappie in lakes than there is just about any other kind of fish. So there's not, there's a, that's a great reason for it to, to grow. Right. Well, life scope's made it a lot of fun. Let me ask you another question. Um, people might be curious about. So high vis or clear line or braid. So that's kind of a neat question. Um, the way fish see color is supposed to be the same, supposed to be, there's not any true science on what fish see, but they're supposedly seeing color like we do. It's a reflection off from UV, from light, um, the spectrum that they can see and it reflects. So they say that fish can't see orange or red, you know, that it gets down, it disappears and dissipates at a foot under the water, two foot under the water. Um, when you put a colorant into anything, you know, it's a color. It's there so we can see it. I I believe in crystal clear water that they see a slight, maybe gray line, a little bit of gray. I think if it's fish that have been pressured and caught, I think it can make a difference. I like running, you know, this is fluorocarbon line here. Um, I think. Uh, I do a lot of different stuff. Sometimes I do a braid to mono if I'm wanting to get down there, have sensitivity, but the bait to fall slower because monofilament floats, fluorocarbon sinks, and so does braid. So I'll go to a 14-pound monofilament line to a 10-pound braid leader. That way, whenever it gets down there, it's floating slow. And sometimes, the, especially like black crappie on brush piles and stuff, um, they still want it moving but they just want a slow fall and they shoot up out of the brush pile and eat it. The most active ones, um, you know, Truman tomorrow, I got a guide trip. We'll be going straight braided line. Um, we're looking, we're just going to hit, even if a tree has 50 fish on it, we're probably going to go into it for about two minutes, three minutes and get the act, most active fish and then just keep moving on. And those most active fish are kind of like a deer in a rut. You can go stand in the woods and that deer can run all over around you and not even look at it. <laughs> you know, those active fish, right. do that and they'll, they'll hit it. Um, but when you get into those fish that have been pressured or just getting finicky, I think fluorocarbon line makes a huge difference. You know, uh, I just explained to you, um, I'm, I'm using a lot of canine line products. Mainly their braid is what I've ran. But I used a lot of different stuff whenever I was down with uh, Eric Cagle on in Alabama. He's a, he's a guide down there. And they have a high-vis fluorocarbon line. Now, fluorocarbon is so fish don't see it. Um, but this, so it kind of defeats the purpose of putting a color in it. But where, where it helps, what, what's so great about it is fluorocarbon line doesn't have any stretch in it. 
Right. And uh, so you can get something that is coming smooth off of your reel and you can see it and it doesn't have any stretch. So it's kind of a best of both worlds. Um, I use, I do do a little bit of casting with a braided line to the floral carbon leader. Um, and it's, man, that's super, super sensitive. So if they're being real finicky, you know, I might put the floral leader so they don't see it, but have the braided line. So I have the sensitivity when they just come up and barely tap it. Um, you know, that's, that's a little, that's a, that's a good subject. And there's lots of stuff to talk about with that. That's just like this rig here. You know, I run a tungsten weight. I like tungsten because it's, it's a lot harder than lead and any kind of vibration, it, it sends it up the line. It doesn't absorb it. It just right. transmits it. As soon as it, the line gets touched, that jig gets, or the jig gets touched and it sends up the line instead of a lead weight there absorbing any of the vibrations. This is a super hard material and it just sends it right up the line and to the graphite of your pole and you feel stuff a little bit better, but I'll run. I catch so many fish by just a mistake. They don't mean to eat it. They're just inspecting it. And I run an itty bitty, like 164 ounce hair jig. And I like to have the tungsten and uh, they just come up and they're just nipping at it. You know, they don't mean to eat it. You know, you know how the difference is when a right. fish eats right. it. I call it nosing it. They just like, yeah. it's like they're just bumping it. Yep. Yeah, come up and kind of bump it. Well, downsizing is something itty, itty bitty they can suck it in, you know, when they bump it, it, it gets in their mouth. Um, I actually tie a uh, hair and just like a hair jig, but onto Aberdeen hooks. So they're completely weightless. And when you get it down there and you, you know, you get it finally where it sinks all the way down and you pick it up, but then you drop your weight, it'll come back up and just slow. It'll just sit there. And those fish, have no resistance whenever they try to pop, you know, to try to get it. The only thing they feel is the, the lure itself. Right. Maybe if you have a niblet on there or, um, or something that um, an amino acid that they react off of, they might hold on to it just a little bit longer. So when you get it and you feel the pressure, you can set the hook. Um, I think that all comes down to just fishing a lot, you know, and uh, time on the water. Yeah. Time on the water. Time on the water is, got a lot a lot to do with it i spend until i had our first we had a, our first child i probably spent 300 days a year on the water wow. so that's and if you just get, are completely oblivious to the what's going on under the water in 300 days in one year you're going to learn a lot of stuff you know, I relearn stuff all the time that I completely forgot about just because it's there's a lot of information to try to register when you're on the water that much. You know, that's why I th have to think so hard about certain fishing trips. And so I can almost I can remember almost every fishing trip, though. And I've fished very like that hard since I was 17 years old, besides whenever I had school or I had to work. But I'm. I'd get out of school and I'd have an hour to go fishing. I was, I was going to drive the hour to go up there just to have an hour a day. I like to fish. Wow. You know? Yeah. So it's has a lot to do with drive. You know, if you don't, have, you know, I lost a little bit of drive one day last week on uh, Darbone. And uh, I think that that probably is what helped me the most because losing it, I was mad at myself for doing that. And I knew I had to, you know, I had to re recover from that. So I had to fish even harder. Um, I, I lost on the classic on Grenada and, uh, it's the worst loss I've ever had because I, one, I was 14 hundreds from winning it. And two, I, I had some troll motor issues and some different stuff. And, um, but I fished the last two hours because of all that stuff happening. I kind of fished at like 90%. You know, I should have been at 110%. If I would have fished at 110% and left everything I had out there on the water, I might have I might have been able to pull it off. You know, that was a very tiny upgrade I needed to do. But when you right. you run into the inevitable with troll motors and motors and 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 stuff, you know, it's it's tough. I know guys that have won on Truman Lake when their troll motors quit. And I just held on, their partner held on to a tree 
and one guy finished and they pulled to the next one, you know, or started the motor to pull back up to the next one. I've, you know, there's guys that have won like that because they didn't give up at all. You know, they just never stopped and thought about the bad part. So that's what helped me though down there in Darbone was have an experience like that and knowing that I did not want to have another experience. I might have won it if I would have just tried a little harder. And I think that goes into everything, you know, getting up to go to work in the morning, you know, yesterday might have sucked, but I don't want today to suck any worse than (laughs) yesterday. (laughs) So let's take on the day, you know. Well, I I know you've got your family waiting and you've got a guy trip in the morning. So I, I just want to say this. You're a very mature 22 year old. Um, I really, I really truly appreciate you uh, and your knowledge and sharing it with everybody out there and uh, you spending your time with us this evening when I know you've got your, your, your kid and your, and your wife nearby. And yeah, um, we yeah. really do appreciate it, Matt. Yeah. But you know, and that's one thing that's awesome about her. Her name is Trinity and she is just an awesome person. And understands this is this is my livelihood and this is what I've dedicated um, a majority of my life to. And uh, of course, now it's like you said, mature. You, you learn new things every day, especially when you start getting past 21 years old. <laughs> um, family is definitely the most important, and I'm I'm learning that. Uh, especially I traveled last year, so traveling last year made me realize how much you know I miss by not being home. Um, but then again, you know, look at what some of these professional bass fishermen put into it. They're gone. They're gone for months. I mean, you know, crappie fishing is a very small scale compared to the bass fishing. Um, those guys still, a lot of those guys still fish the bass master opens, which were like what they qualified to get into them, but they can still fish them because they might need to cash a check in that to, you know, make the gas money to be able to go fish the Bassmaster Classic. Sure. It's still, it's still a, a grind for tournament anglers. It's not quite what it's made out to be on TV and stuff. You know, it's yeah. still blood, sweat, and tears to be able to, to fish tournaments for a lot of guys. Um, of course, some of the people that paved their way by winning two or three Bassmaster Classics, those guys have got it. They've yeah. got it made, you know. Um, but to crappie fish and travel, it's it's. I mean, you you really have got to win because it's not the same scale with money. You know, they're winning. Fast masters are winning two hundred thousand dollars. We're we're finally <laughs> winning like ten thousand dollars. And uh, there's places like Angler Sport Marine here, really close to me on Truman Lakes, stepped up. They're putting a thousand dollars on a national qualifier if you're fishing out of their boat. And if you win, and then if you win the classic fishing out of their boat, they're, they're, they're putting down $10,000. So, you know, that's, that's enough, you know, incentive. I don't do it for the money at all, at all, but to be able to fish, you have to have money. Right. So if I can go rake a yard and make just enough to make $20 and <laughs> make it a Truman, you know, I, I'm willing to do that for sure. And, uh, there's there's definitely companies and products that you can get behind and and uh, promote and on both ends it works and they help you out and you help them out for sure um, that's actually what I was going to show you guys real quick was a uh, a bait uh, it's a crappie bomb it's by jellyfish and I'll show you one out of the package oh, but cool. it's, it's a uh, I'm not going to say it's exactly snagless because you can snag up anything that's <laughs> Right. These uh, these especially in the willow trees on lakes that are uh, you know are shallow and kind of flat, and the fish do move in when the water gets high, and they move into their bushes or anything like that. I tip them with a minnow, and um, they're extremely extremely awesome. And that's Jellyfish USA. And uh, go to JellyfishUSA.com. Yeah, jellyfishusa.com, and they have they have a Facebook page. Uh, cool. There's a father and son, a father and two sons. One of them is a guide on Truman that I know really well. His name is Bradley Jelinek. He won the Team Bassmaster on Lake Hartwell this past fall, and then the other one's doing the the company side of this stuff. And uh, these little baits are 
extremely awesome when those fish are up in the bushes and willow trees. And what it is, is it's just a, a spoon, basically. But whenever you get hung up and you drop it, it's got enough weight that it it will pull pull itself off of the limbs. I mean, I fished them in cedar trees as well or brush piles, but I tip them with a minnow. You know, a guy wouldn't have to. Um, if he wasn't going to tip them with a minnow, you know, I'd put a little smaller shank, a smaller shank hook on them. But uh, those are an awesome, awesome little bait. Um, Give me a closer look at that again. Put that up in the camera. I want to see this. That's nice. So vertical jig over brush piles, or you're saying willow trees? And I'm not. I'm not. I'll probably. I'll probably cast some of them. You really? know, certain fish. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hesitate at all to try casting, because if you reel that by and you can keep it above them just a little bit and bring it by them, they're gonna. They're gonna follow that, and then they're gonna. They're going to eat the, especially if you tip a minnow on it, they're going to eat a minnow that's hanging off of there. Um, and you fish a lot of black crappie, right? Black crappie, yes. Yeah, and see, they're a totally different animal, you know, versus the white crappie in Grenada Lake. <laughs> I mean, oh, so. Tell me the difference. What's the, what would you? <laughs> well, you can take this down there to Grenada Lake and catch <laughs> big old crappie and their white crappie. And you could go throw that in front of a bunch of black crappie and they swim up and run away from it because they're scared. <laughs> you know, whenever I go up to the black crappie, I, of course, this is one, This is another bait that I pour. There's a little size comparison. Let me get them both in. Oh, wow, yeah. And that one's got big ribs, distorts a lot of water. It's got a, a big tail that distorts a lot of water. You know, that one doesn't distort near the amount of water or displace the amount of water. Those fish can find that a lot easier. You know, and that's been a thing for a long time, big, big bait, big fish. I think that kind of, you know, if I were to say on Truman Lake, you went down a tree where it had 10 black stumps on it and dropped that, the most active, the most active fish are going to eat it, not necessarily the biggest. Right. Uh, I've caught crappie on big baits. I mean, I've caught crappie, little ones that were, I mean, smaller than the jig I was using just because it was a reaction you know that's that's just what's coded in them because it doesn't matter if they're a week old or a year <laughs> old you know, they right. coded in them uh, you know i think uh most of the uh most most uh fry crappie i think that they're gonna you know they're gonna eat on zooplankton and and stuff but then that's what that's what the whole ecosystem actually survives off of a zooplankton and of course bugs and stuff but shad you know the shad eats the zooplankton and the crappie eats the shad so wherever the zooplankton goes the shad go the crappie go but there's different things with that as a uh, crappie crappie aren't gonna probably follow except for certain times of the year in the fall in the fall they'll follow a lot of different size shad but a you know, a lot, a lot of times in the summer, they're going to be around, set up around the right size shad. You know, you can go through a place and see all this bait and never see a crappie. Well, that's not the right size shad that they're eating at that time. You know, they're, those might be five inch shad and they're focusing on those inch and a half, inch and a quarter right. front that just, just spawned out and are a few weeks old. Um, I think living on Truman Lake and Stockton Lake being two totally different places, one clear where you can see 10 feet down and one where you can see four inches down is what's really helped me learn different fish you know they both got black and white crappie and they both live totally different each one of them gotcha yeah there's no doubt that's helped you <laughs> so well hey matt i want i do appreciate you uh for spending the time with us and uh can we do it again oh yeah yeah i'd love to um and we could I'd like to just do the next one. We can just specifically talk about live scope and I can probably have papers that are diagrams to, you know, help, help show. And I'd love to do that stuff. All right. Hey, I, I appreciate it. And thanks again, man. I appreciate you uh, hey. coming on tonight. No problem. Sorry. I probably got off track like 10 times. So <laughs> get my brain going. <laughs> thanks, man. Hey, thank you. Thanks for watching another three pound fishing episode sponsored by these great companies.